Welcome to another episode of Trial Site News. The BF.7 subvariant of the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is ripping across the country of China in a devastating wave. Reports are coming in that the healthcare system there is now overwhelmed. We're going to discuss what is happening there. And so from Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and our episode is starting right now. So, SARS-CoV-2, BF.7, and possibly other infectious Omicron subvariants are tearing through the world's most populated nation and second-largest economy during an incredibly dangerous surge of COVID-19 across China. The Chinese government's recent and abrupt turnaround from the rigid zero-tolerance COVID policy has led to what has become a sort of forced organic herd immunity. Which then causes the question to arise, has the Chinese government made a calculated bet here? That is, knowing that the virus isn't as lethal as past variants, has China now deliberately induced herd immunity by mass exposure and infection? While case counts, hospitalization, and mortality data is not reliable in China, some sources in the West are suggesting that the death toll could range from somewhere between 5,000 per day to as high as 9,000 per day, according to the health data from Airfinity. All major media outlets seem to concur that the elderly, especially the unvaccinated, will bear the brunt of mortality. The World Health Organization has warned the healthcare system in China could be under severe pressure, and the conditions in China are now being reported to be similar to such conditions witnessed in northern Italy or New York early on in the pandemic. So what exactly happened here? Well, we have two things to look at. First, in late October, the current surge started driven by BF.7, an Omicron subvariant that's highly transmissible. Now, the name BF.7 is actually short for BA.5, 2.1.7, which is, quite frankly, a mouthful. It is a sublineage of the Omicron variant BA.5. BF.7 is the most infectious of all the Omicron subvariants, and, perhaps most importantly, the pathogen transmits a greater capacity to infect those who have already been infected or vaccinated. The second part of this is China's zero-tolerance COVID policy, which led to the continuous lockdowns and isolation upon any outbreak of the infection. This was enforced with rigor across China's 31 provinces, municipalities, and autonomous regions. That is, until recently. The beginning of the end of the zero-tolerance COVID policy was the deadly fire that broke out in Urumqi, the capital of the Uyghur Autonomous Region, on November 24th of 2022. Apparently, local lockdowns there made it impossible for residents of the apartment buildings to escape in time. And sadly, those trapped inside were burned alive. Protests then ensued. The Chinese people had had enough. And the deaths there triggered enormous anger across the entire country. The people of China were already livid over their three years of draconian zero-tolerance COVID policy. And as such, these protests spread quickly to most parts of the country. There were calls for the ouster of Xi Jinping, the paramount leader of the People's Republic of China, aka the Communist Party of China. And this naturally spooked the nation's ruling class. By December 7th, the Xi Jinping government responded, opting for an abrupt turnaround from zero-tolerance COVID. This shift, however, coincided with an existing COVID-19 surge, and with a loosening up of restrictions, the Chinese government decided then to sit back and let the virus rip through its society. This includes, by the way, the Chinese health authorities having stopped tracking cases. So what about the vaccines in China, I hear you say? Well, as it happens, the elderly is the least most vaccinated in that country. You see, China executed a massive vaccination scheme across the nation during the summer of 2021. But interestingly, the elderly in many cases were simply left alone, particularly in rural areas. Now, the next question to ask, will the Chinese COVID surge impact the Chinese health system and economy? Clearly, deaths are high, but obtaining an accurate report is probably near impossible. Radio Free Asia reports funeral homes in and around Beijing working around the clock, and cremations are backlogged by five days. Only time will tell as to the global impact of this surge in the world's second biggest economy. 
So what then are the implications for economies here in the West? China, after all, is a major producer slash supplier of many important goods, from pharmaceutical inputs to healthcare supplies to a range of other products. Will supply chains take further hits? And while all of that is going on, some government representatives in the West are expressing concern that the current COVID-19 surge in China could lead to further mutations, powering yet more pandemic surges as people are still traveling by air, for example, from China back to the United States and elsewhere. As of now, the U.S. is requiring COVID-19 tests for people entering the country. And the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, are testing wastewater samples from international aircraft to monitor for variants entering the country. Which, according to Reuters, would be a policy superior to outright travel restrictions. Which seems a bit of a stretch, but okay. Now, according to the New York Times, the China's average citizen's response to the U.S. testing rules now in place didn't seem that out of place. As a software engineer at a technology startup in the southern Chinese city of Guangzhou said, it's just a COVID test before traveling. We've been doing a bunch of tests like this for the past three years. And then, of course, we have some of the more absurd responses from the European Union, as reported by the BBC. Apparently, they're calling out the testing of Chinese citizens due to the SARS-CoV-2 surge as, quote, unjustified. The European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, otherwise known as the ECDC, declared the surge in China was, quote, not expected to impact the EU. So naturally, of course, we ask, what is the basis for the ECDC's claim? While the European Public Health Agency does anticipate high levels of COVID in China due to low immunity across the country, the agency suggests higher immunity in the EU means a COVID surge in China is not expected to impact the bloc. But of course, we have to ask the obvious, how can the ECDC possibly know this? The ECDC also reported that current SARS-CoV-2 variants circulating in China are also in the EU, and that the potential imported infections from China are rather low compared to the number of infections already occurring in the EU. Also, the public health agency for the continent points to a relatively high vaccination and previously infected populations, which means higher overall immunity. The EU health officials declared that they will continue to remain vigilant and will be ready to use the emergency breaks if necessary. Good to know the emergency breaks are ready. Hmm. Now, other nations, though, have a less of a tolerant stance than that of Europe. India, for example, has instituted mandatory negative tests requirement for people from China and for other Asian nations to enter the world's second most populous nation. While in Japan, travelers from China will be tested upon arrival. According to the recent BBC report, people that test positive must quarantine for up to a week. And starting here in the new year in Taiwan, anyone arriving from China via air or sea must take a COVID test upon arrival. And that, my friends, will bring our episode to a close once more. For more stories like this, you can check back here daily, Monday through Friday, as well as numerous written articles at trialsitenews.com on a daily basis. In the meantime, and as ever always, thank you so much for joining me on the program today. From Trial Site News, I am Adrian, and I will see you all next time.